Welcome back to another episode of the Better Learning Podcast. I'm excited about our, our guests today because they're names that people, our audience, are probably going to be familiar with, and we, we're going to have a lot of common circles in here. So we're going to navigate through some discussion that that's really at the heart of why this podcast exists. But I'm going to pull in our guests today. Uh, first, we have Susanna Johnson. She is the founder and CEO of, of Individualized Realize, correct? Mm-hmm. Got yes. got that right, but she's got a whole bunch of other things going on too that we'll, we're going to talk about. And then Nick Salmon, who is the founder and president of Collaborative Learning Network. So Nick, Susanna, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, All thank right. you, Kevin. So glad to we, be here. Yeah, we we can go a lot of different ways with this, as we were just kind of talking before we started recording on this. I'm going to start at just like the basic of what I think we all, we all three agree on and we're all just trying to figure out in our own ways of how to do this better is that we all feel like uh, education needs to get better and we're doing a lot of really good things, but we're doing them in our own little silos sometimes. I, I think at the core, we all kind of have this passion to improve education and give the best opportunity for each kid to to succeed. Is that, is that a pretty good place to start? Sure. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's good to kind of frame that and they, and remember, like, there's a lot of people in education all looking at it from a different way. So I know the two of you have worked together before. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of put this out there of like, what what are some of the initiatives, things that you're working on that you're recognizing uh, that you'd like to share with this audience that can kind of start our conversation? And, and I'm sure we'll go 800 different directions from there. As you mentioned, we each have our own companies and we collaborate with each other and we collaborate with other people. But the one thing that we've been working on recently has taken on the name of Three for Community. It's a better name than where we were a year ago or so. The idea is that no 18-year-old would go to the university. And instead, they would invest the next three of their years of their life in service to others. And so that could be in their own community. It could be elsewhere in the world. It could be the Marine Corps, Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, Conservation Corps. It could be faith-based service. Some people have even prompted us to say, well, isn't working in a a nursing facility a, a way of serving others? And so I guess in our expansive model of what this could be, uh, sure. But the idea is let's break that treadmill that we've been on for so long of assuming that every young person is headed to university and then being shocked by how few of them actually finish the university. And just in gross terms, about 100 kids entering ninth grade in America, only 80 of them graduate. And of the 80, only half go to the university. And of the half that go to the university, only half of them actually get a degree. And And then I think someone in Japan, Susanna, was telling us, and only half of those people actually get a degree in an area that they end up working in. And and so all the financial and health and every other benefit that comes from having a university degree is really held by a pretty small number of people. And a large number of people see no benefit or they see actually a big deficit because they went to university for a while, they took on a lot of debt, didn't get the financial advantage of that degree and then struggle. And so our thought is, well, what if we could disrupt this expectation that 18-year-olds go to university? And um, what would that then do to disrupt everything else about education afterwards? We know for sure that if young people choose to go to the university at an older age, they're going to finish. So there's a big upside to universities to recruiting older kids rather than younger kids. And there are many other benefits that we can envision, but we also can see, wouldn't it be cool if university is no longer the expectation for a high school graduate, how could we change everything K-12? Because that could really, really turn everything on its head if we're not trying to set thing, kids up to get a high score on the SAT or something. Um, wow, it could be yeah. amazing. Oh, so, I love that. It's a conversation yeah. I love having because, it, and I'm going to pull, how, what's your aspect of that, Susanna, before no, I start for sure. adding well, some commentary to that? 
Yeah, no, this is, um, and I appreciate that. Thanks for the space, but it's, um, we're in the business of human development. I've been saying this for years. I'd love to rebrand education as that and keep that in mind. And um, from what Nick is talking about, the, we have to find ways to really disrupt all the systemic barriers that are really not working. We, we have so much evidence about how all these processes are not working. And um, from the very personal and micro example, I'm thinking of the stories of my friends and other teachers and um, just people who I, kids that I've worked with in the past, that level of stress and anxiety that is being a high school student just trying to get ready for college and how how awful that is for humanity in general. And then, as Nick mentioned, the, the fact that like such a small percentage, I mean, when you break those numbers down, I'm not a mathematician, but it really, you know, we're talking about out of every hundred kids, maybe five to 10 of them get what they want out of the whole going to college and getting a job experience. And that's not okay. That's a 90% failure rate in my book. And, and, and there's a lot of harm that is caused along the way. Right. And so just from that humanity standpoint of like, how are we taking care of these young humans? How are we developing our future society? What's coming out of that? And we're seeing what's coming out of that. It's not okay. We're not good as you know, just our society and globally um, struggling in a lot of ways to get through this because we have this mindset that this is the only way, but what if as Nick said, we disrupt it with something that is not only good for the well-being of the students so that they aren't having to jump through all those terrible hoops and have all of that anxiety and stress going into taking exams and getting the AP credits and making sure that they apply and then the money and all those things that go into it. So from that standpoint, they're going to have a better run of it and we could really shift the way that our 14 to 24 year olds are are emerging and developing like wouldn't that be great if our we could take care of all that but then also this idea that it's connected to the community because i think that's something that is really important in from all of the experiences and all of the the great learning that i've seen all over the world the number one thing is when it's connected to the community when people feel connected to what it is that they're doing and they have a, a purpose for it and they understand how it matters. It, it really does not just engage the learning more, but it also helps to bring in the opportunities that come from that, right? Those connections with being able to go have that, that local community, have that input, have mentorships, internships, all of those things are along these same lines of like, how are we really thinking about this in a way that is true learning, authentic learning, liberated learning, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so many, so many things in there. So first I want to, I want to dig into guys. I, I completely agree with that premise. And I've talked about it a lot is that if you talk to any K-12 school district in the country and, you know, whether it's private, charter, public school, you go through and you say like, you know, talk through the mission statement and things and the vision. And you can pretty much, once you like actually like dig into those fancy words that they, that nobody knows other than where it's written, you know, somewhere is that they're either trying to get kids into college or they're trying to get kids into a better college. And that's their, their basis of success. Um, and it's how it's presented out to the communities that they're in. It's, you know, like that's what they're looking at. Now, I think COVID accelerated it. And I do feel like there's a lot of movement and hearing you talk about this too, is that it may, it, it's shifting a little bit, but it's still the predominant kind of track that that school systems view as success is doing that. So, yeah. so I love that you're, you're talking about that um, because it does change everything. If all of a sudden that is not the end goal measurement of success, what happens to K-12 education? And that's what I get really excited about. And, and it's a hard conversation to have in communities where it's dominated, say, by a small college or university because the people who show up to the community meetings about the future vision of education tend to be the people who thrived under the dominant model of education. And they don't so, see so any five, reason. Yeah, those roughly 5% reason, that we talk about. Yeah, and they don't see any reason to shift it. Uh, if anything, they feel threatened that their child won't have the same opportunities if, if the priorities of the uh, school setting change. And there are techniques that I've used, and I suspect Susanna has as well, when engaging a community to, to draw in those other voices, uh, to draw in the young, the voices of young people, to draw in the voices of people who 
are committed to the success of the of the school, but not necessarily from the perspective of and keep everything the same. <laughs> so those are the some of the kinds of people that we're hoping to draw into this conversation as as this begins to take shape is how do those voices of young people and their aspirations, well, what would it look like? What would my service look like? What would I like to see change in my middle school and high school years that helped me prepare for that? You know, and then for organizations that would be the beneficiaries of all that youthful energy to come and work in their settings, what are they looking for? Uh, we don't know that yet. We have some suspicions, but that will only come from facilitating thoughtful conversations in in uh, in some communities to get started. Say what what would this look like? How how could we make this dramatic transformation using the infrastructure that's already there? I rattled off the Marine yeah. Corps, Peace Corps, et cetera. You know, uh, so it, it's answer. really it's just putting it under a new umbrella of saying. Wow, when I finish school, I'm going to go serve my community in some way. I'm going to learn from from that experience. So as you're having these discussions with communities, I'm curious to hear like where do things start freeing up and where do the light bulbs start coming off, like really going off and saying like, oh, well, if we did do that, what would that kid like? What would that experience when they're coming in, you know, at four or five years old and saying we got them here until they're 18? What does that look like? than if the preparation is for three years of some type of service. Yeah, I, and I think that that's the, the thing that we are, it's the hopeful expectation, but it's, I think, a very strong one. And when we have these conversations with people, I mean, just even when I talk about it with friends that aren't in education, it really comes up very quickly of like, wow, that would be a really different experience because we, we would have so much more time to develop passions and interests and identity. We would be able to have that confidence, right? And when we ask, you know, when you look at the list, the business insider list, the all the different postings of like what companies want for their employees versus what we are expecting for kids, like the test scores are completely irrelevant for what companies are looking for, right? And so giving kids a chance to, our learners a chance in the, the K-12 program to go through that without this thing of it being about the hoops and the numbers and the test scores. And it's about who are you as a human? What do you wanna do, right? There are different ways to serve, different ways to, to consider this. Um, it's a big shift. It's gonna take a lot of mindset restructuring for a lot of people because there are a lot of um, my generation and above the people who say, this is the way that I got here. I, I, got out, I went to school, I went to college, I got a job, I'm really successful. I have a big fancy house and I drive the car that I want and I take vacations where I want to. And my kid needs to be able to have that same life or better. But they don't understand that the world is really different. So I think we have a lot of work to help to do this. But what Nick is talking about in terms of inviting in the young voices, we're already seeing that from our young learners right now and what they're advocating for. They're not interested in in there are a lot of them choosing not to go to college and um, application numbers are down, enrollment numbers are down because they're like, I can't afford it. I don't know why I would do that. It's not relevant. Um, the service capacity of being engaged in local politics or advocacy, like I think that would be something that would open up. But I, I really feel like we would really see a shift in it coming back around to being about who are we as humans and how are we developing our sense of identity, our sense of confidence, our capacity to learn. And also then that connection, that purpose, that passion, making sure that things are really um, relatable skills, skills, essential skills, You people call them durable skills or forever skills, that stuff would be able to rise to the top if we weren't trying to get AP scores on the transcript. So this morning I, I had an interview with someone who I would call him a futurist. He he doesn't like that term, but he he's the one who's trying to look at like major disruption and how that happens and how to lead through it. And I feel like we're in that moment right now, um, whether we all recognize it or not. I I think we're in a moment where the the foundation of like the of our education system is really kind of at risk. And some could take that as really negative. Some could take that as like, well, there's a big opportunity. Too. Like if things are crumbling, what's going to pop up and his thought process that I'd love to kind of guide through with us and we can talk through this is it's really hard to answer what things look like in 10 or 20 years. 
Um, but if we get a little closer, we can we can start seeing like, okay, well, yeah, maybe like three, five years away isn't that far away. I can start envisioning that and start looking instead of saying, what is it going to look like? Start answering the question of like, what do we know will not change? Hmm. And I thought it was a really interesting thing to say like, well, what is, if we're looking at education, what do we know will not change? And I guess that's a question I'm going to put out there to the two of you and say like, well, what, what what's not going to change like we can say with almost a hundred percent certainty this is not going to change I'll, I'll offer up one piece and then i'm hoping susanna has some more to share human beings will continue to be born mm -hmm. they will continue to follow a similar uh developmental path of a certain set of capabilities and needs in their very early years and then with very similar major transitions that happen that lots of people have studied whether that's what happens from zero to four or from five to eight you know nine to twelve etc you know there there are significant things that didn't matter whether we were born this year or born a hundred years ago we've all gone through that so that that's about the only thing I can say <laughs> is likely to remain a constant with all the variability that is quite evident to all of us that some people, you know, go through those stages more quickly than others, and some go through them more painfully uh, than others. They were, it felt like every transition in my own life was painful. And that's maybe why I'm such a big advocate for making this big change is that that I wasn't ready to go to school at 18, even though I was, you know, the identified as, well, you've completed this developmental stage, you must be ready, you know. Yeah. But I'm yeah. curious, Susanna, what 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 you would think is is gonna stay the same. I think you're absolutely on the right track. Um, we've been having a lot of these conversations in the what school could be community, especially uh, Capone Siadi and Ted and um, have been talking a lot about our sense of urgency with the capacity, right? The exponential growth moment that we're in when it comes to how the world is changing and technology wise, right? Like the that we aren't preparing kids for 2022, let alone 2050. And so um we have this, we're at a crossroads right now of how are we going to shift things so that we don't all in the next five years become glorified babysitters because we don't need the things that we needed, you know, when we didn't have the, the access to technology. And so I've been on a little bit of a kick lately talking about this increased human capacity. And the thing I think won't ever change is our need to have others around us for the not just the word socialization is sort of a, a a fast way to say it, but it's not really what that's about. It's like, how do we interact with each other? How do we learn to not just be human with each other, but also use that humanity to increase each of our own potentials and capacities? How could we possibly use this time of human development that we call education as a way to um, make sure that we're learning how to collaborate, how to problem solve with the support of others, how to innovate with curiosity because we're not worried about all these other things that are not necessary. There's so much stuff that, so much time that could be freed up, right? And so ask any educator, you know, what if your school day was cut in half and you had the rest of the day to just try to work on whatever you think would be awesome in terms of human development and connection with your students and whatever else. And you're going to get a thousand ideas from everybody. I mean, you know, just ask a couple of people, you'll get 3000. It's going to be incredible because there's so many different ways that we could increase our human capacity in terms of creativity and in terms of how do we really solve problems? I think if we freed up that amount of time, we would be able to solve our big problems. We'd have some justice issues taken care of. We'd have climate issues taken care of, energy issues taken care of in a really, really short amount of time because we would have that capacity for just thinking beyond what we have in front of us right now, if it wasn't a checklist, right? The answer is in our educators and our learners right now. We just have to give them some space for that. That's interesting. So I, yeah, I was trying to go through that too. And I'm like, all right, I kind of agreed with, with both of you. I'm like, well, kids are gonna be born. There's still gonna be kids, right? And there's still gonna be kids that parents are gonna need to have them be doing something. <laughs> So I do come back to whether it, you're like, 
whether we call it glorified babysitting or not, but there, I think we could recognize there is a component of the school system that is a right. daycare system mm -hmm. in there. You know, we hope that daycare system is really helps educate and, and you know, and, and really develop uh, their capabilities out of that. But that's kind of where I got to, I'm like, all right, so there's going to be this. Um, I look three, five years out, I'm like, there's, I don't think we're all, I, I think we're still going to have a political divide. Um, I don't think that's going to be resolved in three to five years. I think we'll still have um, somewhat of a structure to the, to the current funding system. So there's going to be money that's going to be allocated to, to schools um, or school districts. It, it may shift a little bit of like who controls that money. I think we're seeing some of, some of that shift going on right now. And then I think there, I don't think it's going to change. I think, I think we're the constant that we can maybe look at, which kind of ties back into the work that we're doing here with three for community is that I think at the age of 18, they're still going to be considered legal adults. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and when you, and as you say that, I'm thinking about the parents, you know, hearing this idea of service and saying, oh my God, my kid's going to not leave home at 18. Right? Like, but <laughs> that's not what this is. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about increasing that independence and autonomy and that opportunity and connecting with the universities, with the local businesses, with the organizations. And so there is more of this, everybody coming at it together so that it doesn't make, it doesn't change the system that you know that, that these organizations don't exist anymore we want universities to exist we just want to work with them and have them be part of this process of helping learners have an alternative path to what's happening now because it needs to be we just yeah. we're hearing it from the businesses we're hearing it from the kids and we just see it and we know it from all of the numbers and so you're right these things aren't going to change in the next three to five years but if we could start to open up this capacity could we be in a better spot could yeah. we be coming from different directions yeah yeah. yeah. Well, and and the this what each of you've been sharing there reminds me that so in addition to disrupting the the purpose of K twelve learning experiences, we also have the potential of disrupting the political divide because if people, if young people in particular, travel to a community beyond their own maybe they came from a place of great affluence and they're serving some other part of the world where that affluence isn't as prevalent or the inverse, or they begin to interact with each other in some other uh, service setting, they're gonna begin to see that as, as people, we have so much more in common than these unfortunate um, divisions that we've allowed to, to grow to the point that they have. And so I see it also having the benefit of kind of healing the, the fracture that I see. I haven't lived in the U.S. for most of the last three years, so um, I'm watching all the chaos that you guys are living with every day um, from afar, and it's shocking, really, um, the, the times that I do come back and I see and hear and listen to the... the um, kinds of conversations that, well, they remind me of, of other places in other eras a hundred years ago that it's sad to see that kind of thing happening in, in the U.S. And so hopefully this would be the other big upside is, is that people would, would complete these three years plus whatever they choose to do after that, launch a career, continue their service, go to university, whatever it might be. That they'll they'll hold in their heart this idea that one of the big things I can do as a human being is to serve others, and it's not all about my own interests. It's about our collective benefit. So I'd be curious of the conversations that you've already had and and where you think going to is this idea of doing it after kind of high school, having the three years is. Do you think that's going to prompt more of this type of service work being incorporated into the K-12 experience? Or do you think that's that's too hard to kind of break the system yeah. and incorporate that from kind of from your feedback, your experience talking to people? Well, you know, one of the things that I've observed for the last 20 years is lots of young people being asked to go do a job shadow, which I think is one of the biggest wastes of time that, that schools set up. 
And yet young people do need to explore what are the opportunities out there for me in the future? And so absolutely some level of service while in, in particular, the middle school, high school years where you're, you know, you have the stamina to, to, to do various things would be beneficial. And, and it would place that seed and it would integrate that into other learning experiences. We don't, we don't go to school to separate ourselves from our community. We go to schools to be a part of our community. And part of being in our community is, you know, shoveling sidewalks and taking care of trails and picking up the trash that accumulates in our rivers and things and, and, and other things that um, have long been a part of kind of service work for younger people. So yeah, I, I wouldn't see it as as something that would be a heavy lift because it feels like that 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 happens frequently enough in schools already. It just it could be then amplified, uh, knowing that we're trying to prepare young people for understanding. Well, what kind of service do I think would be the best fit for me um, when I when I finish school? You know, we've talked a little bit about this the sake of of who we are as individuals and that's something that I believe in but what I've seen in, in my long journey of doing 100% individualized learning in the classroom for credit is that you just it the productivity goes through the roof everything changes and so really tapping into everybody having ownership of this process and their journey is there but I where Nick is talking about in this connection with the community and what that means it's a sense of belonging. I'm just going to keep coming back around to the human stuff. We all want to feel that. That's the stuff that you asked what's not going to change. We're never going to not need other humans. Right. Yeah, very true. Well, and, and I think that's maybe a good segue into, into something I also want to talk about is, Susanna, you've been a major part of growing this community of what school could be. And I think that's at the heart of it is that it's this community that's being built and being like, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. And, and just how everyone wants to do that. But we all, you're also, and I say I'm part of that community and kind of an offshoot of Ted Dinder Smith's like inspiration of the work that he's done is looking at that community and saying, we kind of got this like small, it's going to be the wrong term to use, but like this army of people around the world um, that are change makers. So where do you see, you know, it happening, whether, you know, like you, you see it coming independently or like actually directly coming from that what school could be community? Is there anything that's kind of purposefully looking to say, like, how can we deploy kind of all these these passionate people into meaningful action? Yeah, and I, I appreciate it. I also don't love the word army, but that's it's a hard a hard one to get away from because it does right. sort of speak to what it is. But um, all the what school could be community champions, um, I like to call them, is they're that's really a word, right? <laughs> they're champions um, and explorers and pioneers, right? Like we could we could also go that direction. We have people who are really pioneering the future of what human development looks like, right? And that's. Um, what I'm seeing through the community and what I'm experiencing is a, a, a large byproduct of the fact that if we look back at Ted's history and the fact that he didn't come from education and yet has been such a huge leader in changing education, tells us everything we need to know about where we need to, mm -hmm. to take education and these practices, right? And um, what's interesting about examples, because I for sure could come up with a hundred examples of how this is, but for me, um, we keep seeing and hearing that if we try something that is absolutely leaps and bounds ahead in any community in terms of giving them something, some freedom, something that liberates it, something that opens up minds and hearts and connects to more authentic experiences and more authentic humanity, taking care of our, um, our humanity, then all the other stuff increases too, right? You could take a look at Stephen Ritz's work in the Bronx Green Machine, and all he did was build a garden in the school that was an entirely failing district for many, many, many years turned into one of the highest performing districts. They didn't start doing more test prep. They didn't start doing, you know, remediation of everything. And yet they turned everything around because who we are, once we start to feel connected as humans and we start to feel a sense of purpose in any part of our life, it actually translates to all the other parts of our life, right? Look at all of us. We're absolutely exploring something that is, you know, not just about a job. We have 
a purpose and a mission. And that's a key part of being a human. And we've been ignoring that in our learners for a long time. And I think that the one of the many good things that came out of the disruption that was um, the pandemic is that kids are calling BS on the whole thing. They're saying like, hey, wait a second, like we don't need you to be able to understand World War II. What we need you to do is to help us make sense of it and help us to find solutions and make sure that we are moving forward in a way that doesn't, that we don't end up in World War III, right? That's what kids are seeing and that's what they're craving and they're they're pushing back and they're asking for it. And so every example I can think of, of how the connections of humanity and how these this, um, set of champions is really getting out into the world. Every single example is the minute you stop worrying about test scores, everything gets better and you actually increase test scores. Like that's that's the bottom line. You start doing project-based learning, guess what? Productivity in other areas gets there. You start asking kids what they care about, everything goes up. It's really very um, simple and interesting to see those correlations. And there, it's not just my thinking or the random examples I've seen from the 13,000 plus people in the community now, it's also the research, right? Look at Yalmeta's work and um, Sarah Fine, you know, what they're talking about in terms of the predictors for success and the what goes into that. Look at Nicole Triel's work in neuroscience and how we are in our psychology. Like this stuff is very well documented. You don't need me to tell you that part of it. The trouble is we've got to make sure that the rest of the world starts to hear this in a real way of, first and foremost, we are actually at this moment in time doing more harm than good in a lot of our schools. Yeah. Yeah. And Nick, I know you want to chime in on here, but I'm going to try to wrap it up because and segue this into the closing of it, because Suzanne, what you just talked about is exactly where I feel like we need to be taking those stories and um, being able to communicate them out to the communities in a lot of ways that Ted did with when he had the documentary of most likely to succeed of like getting this in the communities and have it. But um, we have a nonprofit called Second Class Foundation where the whole purpose is to be able to tell really compelling stories about education, what it could be. So it impacts that. You've mentioned kind of the, like, you know, this, like we, we know that the data and the studies are there that show that if you don't focus on test scores and test scores improve and, and not that that's the ultimate goal, but what other stories like that are you guys experience? Like those types of garden types of stories that you just wish, like the people in the general public, you know, whether they're a parent or they don't have kids in the in the district, you know, in in the school system, you, you just want them to hear of what's going on in, in schools mm -hmm. today. Well, one is is now become kind of an old story, but you know, Milton Chen wrote the book Education Nation ten years ago, maybe, maybe even longer. And one of the stories that he shares is about Bellevue Public Schools, Bellevue, Washington, home to Adobe, Microsoft, lots of high tech. And in the three high schools, they split the AP history class in half. And half the kids took AP history the conventional rote way, you know, it's October 2nd, you're on page 81, you're learning these ideas. You're preparing for an exam in, in May or April. And the other half of the kids learn the same content through a collection of projects. And at the end of the year, every project-based learning kid outscored the conventional kids in their school. Either got equivalent fours or fives or, or, or scored better than them. I don't love AP history, but it's an interesting study that was done. And then, but the compelling piece of this story is that Bellevue has two high schools of affluence, not a surprise, and one school of poverty. That was a surprise to me. And the project-based learning kids at the school of poverty outscored the conventional kids in the school's affluence. To me, that says that those kids in those affluent schools had all the extra resources, all the things that their families invest in them in soccer and cricket playing and everything else that they're doing and tutors and everything else. But that deep, passionate connection that kids made through doing projects that made that AP history class come alive for them meant that they could do just fine. And I think the more that people understand that when we connect kids to what they care about, as Susanna was saying, the scores evaporate. There's really no reason to even bother measuring because what we're now measuring is, does a kid care or not? 
And I guess that's at the root of, of what we're hoping to achieve with this, this vision is that young people will walk away from that experience with clarity about what else they can do in the world because they weren't being constantly measured against some arbitrary you know, set of information. Thank you. Susanna, do you have any other stories you'd want to contribute to that? Uh, I mean, yeah, there, there, are, there are tons. Um, but when we look at the, the work that is coming out of young people right now, right? So given an opportunity to maybe do an internship or a mentorship, mentorship of some sort where they're connected or they're doing some project-based learning that is really connected, um, we're seeing incredible innovation in our workforce, right? Um, I have an example of a, a student here in Hawaii who um, just was uh, leaps and bounds ahead in the world of coding by the time he was in middle school because he really found it interesting and was there. And you know, and that's not uncommon in this day and age. We got a lot of kids who are really interested and in understand that in a way that we have never even imagined and um, got engaged in a mentorship around um, with a local business that is top of the line innovation worldwide. They, they do some incredible stuff. and was able to actually contribute to a project there. So by the time he was 15, he had started his own company um, to be able to just make space for this in his own world. Um, he still you know, kind of handles tech stuff for me, uh, which is hilarious and, and wonderful. I, I pay him handsomely for it. Um, and it's, but, but what happened for this young person is not just that, yeah, he was successful and he's making money and it's great. Everything turned around for him in terms of his sense of identity and who he was as a person. And I just can't think of a better reason to do whatever it is that, that we're doing. I want better humans in the world. I want better thinkers in the world for sure as well. That's my reason for getting out of bed is, is making sure we live in a world of better thinkers. But I also am thinking about the community that's coming out, right? I like what who's going to be alongside me over the next few years. And I think we've gotten into a really big trap um, in terms of saying like when kids get out into the real world, well, this is the real world for them. This is their real world is what's happening for them right now right, with what's in front of them. And our I, arbitrary barriers of numbers and systems and you know schedules one through six, one through eight hours of the day is not working. So the other examples I can think of uh, are really exactly along the lines of everything Nick is saying is that you give a kid a little bit of freedom, a little sense of self and the sky is the limit. It's up to us to remove those systemic barriers. And if we can do so in some really radical ways and show how it works, then it's there, right? Stephen Ritt started Grounds Bronx Green Machine a ton of years ago. Now there are over 600 schools who have done similar things and had the exact same success. It doesn't take a lot to show that success, right? So really easy to start to point to some of these big things and, and where it happened. High Tech High is another great example, even though it was the one that was featured in the, the show and in the movie, it was also one of many that were doing those things, which is why Ted realized that what school could be needed to be said, because it was, he was, it's examples of all the awesome things that are happening around the country. One stone in Boise, Idaho, and letting kids not only drive their learning, but they run the school. They're on the administration. They're on the school board. They make the decisions about what's happening for their education process, and they're doing incredible work out of that. Great examples. Well, I know we're up against a time crunch here, so I want to, want to, wrap it up here but Susanna and Nick really appreciate your time and discussion I feel like um, I think the listeners are all going to pull different pieces of this so um, for the listeners if you want we have a, we'll have links to both of their information of, of ways to kind of get involved and what school could be if you're not part of that community that's absolutely somewhere you should be um, and then also at betterlearningpodcast.com we have a quick survey in there that's just trying to align people's gifts with uh with different ways where we could get some action into this and also if anyone is not subscribed to this just go ahead and hit, hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this uh but Susanna Nick thank you so much I think uh we can have follow-up discussions for a long time about this and and uh, I think we just keep working you know, following each other's work and seeing ways we can help each other as well my big plea, I, the, thank you so much, Kevin, but my big plea is that anybody who's having this conversation is um, to reach out to Nick and I about you have the ideas too and you have the connections and what are the stories that you can help us to, to grow this compelling case of some alternative ways of looking at where we go and what happens. Yeah, um, which yeah. we should, yeah, we should probably talk a little bit more about that too and some of the things <laughs> we're doing. So, all yeah, right. No, thank you, Kevin. It's, all right. it's been really great to have this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. 
The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.